You know, why do you think that uh, people would think that God would bless this evil world? You know, I hear all the time, you know, God bless America. God bless America. But you know, when you really come down to it, we need to ask ourselves, why would God bless this evil world that we're living in? You know, we're doing our best to eradicate God in every part of this world. We're doing our best. We're doing our best to be comfortable and have the consequences of sin in our life. And we're happy with evil. We know this, that no one is ever going to understand the things that God allows. Down through my many years of pastoring, if I had a dollar for every time someone had asked me why in life, I would be a multimillionaire. I don't understand why. You don't understand why. But I always do know that God is one that allows things to happen for our good and to point us to him. Now, I know sometimes that sounds really strange. Things have happened in my life. Things have happened in other people's lives, in my church members' lives. And you say, well, pastor, how in the world can those things be used of God for good? Well, let me give you a little illustration that and it's amazing that um, when I'm preaching on things, sometimes God gives me illustrations. I received a call on Wednesday to do a funeral right after our church service today. As many of you know, we had tornadoes that went through Tennessee and they went through Missouri this past week. And the funeral home called me and they said, Pastor, we've got a really, really sad funeral for you to do this coming Sunday. And it was for a man and a woman. They both were in their 50s. And they were looking forward to retire. They had just bought a farm. And the tornado came through, and the tornado killed both of them. They have one daughter. They only have one child. She has no children. And so I called her on the phone. And I talked with her, and I said to her, I said, you must be going through an unbelievable, difficult time. And I'm going to do my best on Sunday, though, to celebrate your mom and dad's life. And I said, can you tell me something special about your mom and dad that I could incorporate in the service on Sunday? And one of the first things out of her mouth was, well, Pastor... You know, my mom and dad were incredible Christian people. And you know, Pastor, as hard as of a time as this is, I know my mom and daddy are walking the streets of gold. And as hard as a time as this is, Pastor, I know that I'm going to see my mom and dad again. You know, I want to tell you, That young lady was in her 20s, and she was amazingly, amazingly just founded in the truths and the principles of God's Word, because that's the way her mom and dad had raised her. And I told her on the phone, I said, you know, I've talked to a lot of people, and this isn't my first time of doing husband and wife's funerals together, it's not, but I will tell you this, you have been an incredible inspiration to me. And I mean she was. And I told her that at the end of our conversation. And today, she said there's going to be a lot of people there, Pastor. And I said to her, I said, you know, as much as this may sound strange to you, I am really looking forward to Sunday. And I told the Lord again that this morning. I said, Lord, what an awesome privilege 
to stand before those people, many of those people will not know Jesus, and tell the people about what an inspiration this young lady has been. Not only to me, but to so many others. Why? Because she knows Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Amen. Why? Because she knows that as hard of a time as this is that she's going through, all things work together for the good of God. She may not know that today, and I know that she doesn't, because she doesn't know why. But she does know this. Her relationship with God is so strong that even a tragedy of taking her mom and dad out in a tornado has not shaken her faith to the point where she lifted up her hand and cursed God. No, she said, you know, Lord, I'm going to find comfort. I'm going to find peace. I'm going to find encouragement in you. I always have, and I'm going to lean on you, the author and the finisher of my faith. Amen. Wow. Amen. How strong. And I said, Lord, <laughs> of all illustrations to give me when I'm preaching a message on why in the world would a, God, a good God allow evil and suffering in this world? But let's be honest about it this morning. The moral and the spiritual fabric of our lives today and our families and our churches and our nation is absolutely coming apart at the seams. We all know that. We've all seen things happen in the last many years that have just absolutely amazed us how this country and the world for that matter has just pushed and pushed and pushed God out of everything. I mean, even out of churches. We don't have churches standing for God anymore. And you know, it just boggles my mind as a pastor that some people, even Christians sometimes, they say, well, you know, we would all be a whole lot better and things would radically change if we would just vote that person into office, you know. Everything would change, Pastor, if we would just have a little bit more gun control in the world. Everything would be better, Pastor, if we just gave a little bit more money to the police and we build more mental institutions and we build more prisons and all of that. Let me tell you something this morning. Nothing, nothing, nothing is going to solve the issues in our nation, in this world, in our lives more than Jesus. Jesus is absolutely the answer to every single problem that this nation and everybody's life faces. The he is the answer. It is not more politicians believing the right, although we do need that. No, problem's not with some of the godly politicians. The problem's with the people that they govern. The problem is not with the guns. It's with the people that hold the guns. The problem is not rehabilitating people. The problem is getting them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You cannot rehabilitate a sinner. The only way that you can rehabilitate a sinner is for them to come know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You can put somebody in prison. It's like giving a car a new paint job. It's going to still be the same car. And some people are trying to fix things and they really don't know the fixer. Amen. The fixer is Jesus. Listen to me. Jesus is the only solution for the evilness in this world. When we hear horrible things in our nation that happen, and there was another shooting last night in Alabama, if you haven't heard about it, and they know that there is at least six, probably more, teenagers last night that were killed. And we all know about the Nashville shooting that happened a few weeks ago in a Christian school that left many kids and administrators dead. We know about child abuse, as we heard about that young little African-American boy that the man had killed his mom and then took the little boy somewhere and let him loose, and the little boy ended up 
being in an alligator's mouth. And folks, we get horrified at things like this. I get horrified at it. I, I just hardly want to even cut the news on anymore. But you know, we need to call it what it is. It is evilness. It is satanic evilness in our world. And the only solution to any of that is still the same solution that it's always been. And that is Jesus. And you know, in my way of thinking, the Christian church is more responsible for the evil in this world than the unbelievers. Now, some of you may say, well, pastor, I don't believe that way. And that's fine. You're welcome to your opinion. But in my opinion, the Christian church is more responsible for the evil in this world than the unbelievers. And you say, Pastor, why would you say that? I say that because the mission of the church is to preach about the only solution to the evilness of man and women's heart problem, our heart disease, and that is Jesus. We are all born sinners. None of us are righteous, no, not one. And the way to solve our problems in life, our eternal problem, and our problems in life is to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Preached a message last week on homosexuality and transgenderism. And I've had so many people that have told me, and I say this in all humility, okay? Don't get me wrong. I say this in all humility. But the one comment that I've gotten more than any comp comment this week has been, Pastor, I can't believe that you had the boldness to preach that message. Well, I want to tell you something. I'm just preaching what God has told me to preach. I'm preaching the Word of God. We preach the Word of God. We preach the truths of God's Word. And you know, those truths of God's Word are supposed to be convicting. Amen. If the Word of God is not preached in a strong, convicting manner, and it doesn't step on people's toes, and it doesn't make people uncomfortable, you're not really preaching the Word of God. And what people don't understand sometimes is, it steps on my toes before it steps on yours. I can get convicted every day of the Holy Spirit convicting me about things in my life that's not right. And we've got a lot of people today that are standing in pulpits that have no right to be pastors. They have no right to be teachers because all they're doing is they're preaching a feel-good message. They don't ever preach on controversial subjects because they want to everybody to feel great. There are people on television that I will not name, but always make people feel great and wonderful. They haven't preached a convicting message in their whole entire ministry. And they don't ever want to because they want to preach a feel-good message. I'll say this, feel-good does not solve your problems. Feel-good will not solve your eternity. I know a lot of people that are in hell this morning and they felt pretty good about their life but they never asked Jesus to come in to be their Lord and Savior. They're about ready to get some company one day. They're about ready to get some company of the people they used to listen to on television. And that's as far as I'm going with that. I want us to understand this. This is all, that was all introduction. This is another introduction point. Is God is not the author or the creator of evil, nor is he not the author of and creator of anything evil we see or suffering in this world. God is not the author of that. The Bible tells us that God is holy, that he is righteous, and that he is good. When God created man, when God created the earth, after he did it, he looked around. And he said, everything that I have created is good. There are no problems with creation. It's perfect. There is no problem with man. They are good. Everything is good. It's like a home builder. You hire a home builder to build you a house. That home builder builds you a house. 
And that home builder says, I want you to walk around with me. That home is completely perfect. The home has absolutely no issues. It is absolutely perfect. You agree, you sign off on it, all the inspectors sign off on it, and then you get in there and you completely trash the house. You completely trash the house. You call up the home builder and you say, I don't like the house that I'm living in. The house that I'm living in is completely trashed. Nothing works. There's holes in the walls. The faucets don't work. Bathtub leaks, toilet leaks, everything, ceilings falling through. I don't like this house. The builder would ask you, what have you done to the house that I built you that you said was perfect? Amen? Let's pick it up in our notes this morning, all right? It says, number one, says the real question should not be, how can a good God allow evil? The question ought to be, why does God continue to, why does God, excuse me, why does man continue to reject God's solution to evil? Most of the people asking the questions are those that fail to comprehend this. To change our evil lives and our evil world, God's already made a solution to this. Amen? He did that 2,000 years ago when he sent his son to the cross to die on the cross for our sins. That is the solution to evil. That is the solution to our eternal destination in life. So what has happened is God has created a perfect world. A perfect world. And just like that house, we have ruined that world. We cannot hold God responsible for our world. He backed away and said, listen, everything is good. The world is fine. Everything is good. There's no global warming. There's no holes in the atmosphere. Everything is good. There's no tsunamis. There are no volcanic eruptions. There are no hurricanes. There are no tornadoes. Men and women, they are good. They've got perfect hearts. Nothing is wrong. God is saying this today. I have done my job. I am perfect. I am holy. I delivered a perfect world. I did my part. And what you have done, you have done your best to tear up everything that I have built. You have come face to face with me as Savior. The Bible says that every one of us, as I shared at Easter, every one of us will come to a time in our life, I don't care who you are, we come face to face with what Jesus did for us on the cross. We are convicted of God, that we are a sinner, that we have fallen short of the glory of God, and we make a conscious decision either to receive God as our Savior or to reject Him. We have rejected God. Let me prove it to you. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. This is this. Listen. This is a crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world. In other words, God has revealed his self into the world. But men and women ran everywhere for what? They ran for darkness. They didn't run to the light. They ran to the darkness. Why do men and women not run to the light and they run to the darkness? It's very simple. They love darkness more than they do life and light. They love to make their own rules in life, live life as they please, instead of living their lives in the principles of God's word. They went for darkness. God didn't push them to darkness. God did not say, you, I'm going to put evil in your life. No, they ran for darkness. 
We run for darkness of our own free will. Satan does not make you and I sin. No, you can't blame it on the devil. You can only blame your choices. I can only blame my choices on myself. You can't blame them on God. You can't blame them in the year and age in which you're living in. And you can't blame them on the devil. They went for darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. They were like some people in our Easter audience two weeks ago. This happens every Easter. In fact, it happens almost every single week here in this church, either present or online. Here's what happens. We bring you face to face with a loving God that loved you enough that he sent his son to die for you. You know that he did it. You know that you've got issues in your life. You come 18 inches from your head to your heart to receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you say thanks, but no thanks. You know why you say no thanks? You say no thanks because you don't want God and his principles and the lifestyle of godliness to rain on your parade. What you are saying is, I love my sinful lifestyle more than I love what Jesus did for me on the cross. That is as plain as it gets. It says, everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God's light and won't come near it. Is that not what we're seeing today? Let me tell you what we're seeing today. We are seeing God's word. We're seeing godly preaching, everything else, godly lifestyle. We're seeing it, like I told you a minute ago, eradicated, pushed away. Why? Because this world, the people in the world, do not like the light of Jesus. They don't like you. If you're trying to live for the Lord, if your family's trying to live for the Lord, people are going to come against your godly lifestyle. They're going to hate the godliness that you're trying to instill into your kids. They're going to hate when you pray at lunch, at supper and breakfast when you're out. They're going to look at you. They're going to point fingers maybe at you. They're going to whisper under their breath. They're going to think that you're crazy for being here this morning. They're going to think that you're absolutely nuts for having your kids in basketball or football or soccer or bringing your kids here to come into our kids' program or our students into our students' program. They're going to think anything that you're doing to live in godliness absolutely, positively, makes no sense. In fact, it's offensive. That's what they're saying. Why? It's because you and I and this church, when you stand up for the principles of God's word, when you preach the truth of God's word from cover to cover, it reveals light into darkness. The Bible says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? It has none. Never has, never will. What do roaches do when you turn the light on at midnight in your kitchen? They don't hang around and tell you thank you. They scatter. They run. They hide. You know what this world does? When they hear Christian principles... They see a Christian lifestyle. They hear about the Lord. What do they do when they interview sports guys and ladies on television? When they, first thing out of their mouth is they praise God, they cut away from it as quickly as possible. They'll sit there all day long and allow some people to curse, talk about all kinds of evilness, But you let somebody speak out about God and they tune it out. 
the same way it was with our Easter service years ago. We had COVID going on. We were the first church to open up. And we had three news stations that were here, major news stations. They interviewed me in my office. They set me down. And they said, what are you doing? Do you feel like it's safe to open up? What are you doing? All the churches are closed. Who gave you the idea to do this? We've never seen this done before. Well, the first thing out of my mouth was, first of all, I am not smart enough to think about that idea. I give all the glory and the praise to the Lord. He taught us how to plan a drive-in service. He told us how to put cars out there and to have an FM station tuned to people's radios and to have people's windows rolled up and their air conditioning on to listen to the services. And guess what? When I listened to the playback of those things, guess where that statement was? It wasn't in there. They had it exempt that from every single news broadcast that was here. Because I was very purposeful that when anybody said something about that, to tell them about Jesus. Amen. Amen. He not only was he the reason for Easter, he's the reason for the issues in this world. I'm going to brag on Jesus. I'm not going to sit there and brag on me. <clears throat> I ain't have anything to brag about. Like I don't have anything to brag about today. But the problem is this. When Adam and Eve disobeyed, they willingly chose their way. God did not make them pick the fruit of that tree. And do you know something else? Satan didn't shove that fruit down their mouths. He didn't say, you ain't leaving this tree without me shoving this fruit down your mouth. They clearly knew what they were doing. God had told them. God had told them, you know what? Same thing happens to us. This nation is without excuse. We know, we know what this nation was founded on. It was founded on the Word of God. You and I, when we were growing up, we didn't have some of the issues we had today. You know why? Because we still had godly parents. We still had a moment of silence in the schools. We still had politicians that loved Jesus and loved the godly way. And folks, listen. We were a nation that was built on godliness and we knew it. We were following those principles. But as things got ramped up, we all said, well, you know, that's all old-fashioned. We need to kind of spread our wings and fly a little bit. Well, we've flown straight to hell. That's where we've gone. And, but don't think that God has brought any of this on himself because he hasn't. And don't for a moment think that it doesn't break, break God's heart. I believe most unbelievers today really don't want God to remove all evil from the world. You know why? Because I believe they just want God to remove the consequences of their evil. They don't really want God to remove all the evil from the world because they enjoy the evil. They just want God to remove the consequences of evil. What are you talking about, Pastor? You know, I like being a robber. I love robbing banks. But you know what I wish God would do? I wish God would just remove the consequences of being arrested. I do not like doing that, being arrested. Cannot God please remove the consequences of me being a robber? You know what? I am a drug addict. I love my drugs. I love my alcohol. But cannot God remove my hangovers? Cannot God remove all the problems that I'm having with my drugs? I like those things, you know? You know, I, I like running around in my marriage. I like that. 
but can't God remove my wife finding out about it? <laughs> or my husband, or my kids? Come on! God, if you really love me, you know you'd help me with some of those consequences. God, you know I, I really like telling lies. But God, can you please just cut down on the people finding out about my lies? Man, I love to lie. I know we're laughing, but folks, that's the truth. People don't want God to take care of all the evil of the world. They just want God to take care of the consequences. They said, hey, God, give me all the fun, but hey, can't you just take away some of the consequences? It's like saying this. When we're raising our kids, listen to me. When we're raising our kids, our kids tell us what they want to do. I don't know how you raised your kids, but my kids, when they were growing up, they told me and they told Vicki how things were going to be. And I let them talk. And Vicki let them talk. And you know what? They did not get their way. They did not get their way. I don't want to be home at 9 o'clock. Well, guess what? You're going to be home at 9 o'clock. I don't want to eat my vegetables. You're going to eat your vegetables. I don't want to go to school. You are going to school. I don't want to go to church. You are going to church. I don't want to do my homework. Guess what? You're doing your homework. I mean, all of the things that you could imagine. You, you know what I'm talking about. What one of us sitting here today when our kids were telling us how things needed to be in our home, which one of us today would say, you know what? You can do everything that you want to do. I don't want to offend you. I want to be a loving parent. After all, this is 2023. Anything goes. Heaven forbid if I correct you. Heaven forbid if I barge in and tell you that you can't spend 24 hours a day playing video games or on your smartphone or Snapchatting and tiki talking. Listen, <laughs> heaven forbid. You say, Pastor, that's stupid. I would never say that. And no, you know why you wouldn't say that? It's because you want to be a loving parent and you know that if you don't correct your kids, if you don't raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, if you are not giving your kids the right way to go in life, that they will crash and they will burn. You would not be a loving parent if you didn't correct your children. And here we are having a world that says the same thing. I want to do what I want to do in life. I don't want to go and hear that Pastor Branson talk about things that I can't do. In life, you know what, I want to do whatever I want to do, so therefore I'm not going to be around anything this godly because I want to do what I want to do in life. That's a big reason that our churches are not full today. And the other big reason is because we have churches and Christians that are so weak in their faith that sometimes you can't tell the difference between a Christian and somebody going to hell throughout the week quiet in here. You know why? We've got a bunch of Christians today that have bowed and they've bent to the things of this world and now they're not even living godly. Heaven help us. Number two, God will not and not and not violate free will because his eternal purpose requires it. God is not going to make us to be robots. He's not, because he will not violate our free will. God is what he's trying to do. He's trying to re redirect evil out of this world in a through a voluntary basis. And that means that when we receive him as Lord and Savior, and we embrace him as our Lord and Savior, we voluntarily refuse the evilness of this world. God wants us to receive him as Lord and Savior through our own free will. Amen. Every invitation that I've ever given in church 
and I've asked people to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, Jesus does not come down the aisle, or we don't have people coming down the aisle jerking people out of their seats that have raised their hand and saying, you are going to receive Jesus today no matter what you say. No. Everybody that receives Jesus has received Jesus voluntarily. You have freely made a free will choice to receive what Jesus did for you on the cross. Jesus wants you and I to love him out of our own free will. If I tell Vicki, and say, well, let's back it up. If God has pre-programmed me to always say I love my wife, and every time I look at her and I say, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I say it a thousand times a day because that's the way God programmed me. You know, everything's going crazy. I say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. It's like buying one of them bears, you know, for Valentine's Day. Some of you guys pick these bears, and all they got to do is press the bear claw, and the bear say, I love you, I love you, I love you. What if God programmed us as men like those bears? We always said love you. You know, Vicky, you know, burns my, burns my apple crisp. I love you, you know. <laughs> And I still do, by the way, but that probably would not be my reaction. Amen? <laughs> but after a while, she would look at me and she'd say, you know what, I don't believe a word you're saying. <laughs> you know why? Because I don't mean it from my heart. I am pre-programmed to say, I love you, I love you. It'd be like all of us be programmed like that. Here you just tick me off, I look at you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> That would ruin some of y'all's days. Amen? That would stop all of your gossip. For heaven's sakes, why would you want something like that? Amen? Say, Pastor, I like getting angry. Somebody just cut me off about knocking me in the guardrail. I love you. I love you. <laughs> we don't want that. We want to be mean. We want some evil. Amen? Y'all can say amen to that because it's true. In other words, God's saying, I'm not going to pre-program you to tell me that you love me. Amen. When you tell me that, I, that you love me, I want you to tell me that, I, that you love me out of your own free will. Amen. When I tell my wife I love her, my, Vicky doesn't want me to say that because I'm pre-programmed. She wants me to say that from my heart. And guys, you, your wife wants the same thing out of you. Amen? Amen. And listen. You need to say it a lot more often than you do. And ladies, there's nothing wrong with telling your man that you love him once in a while either. Amen. After he does the dishes for you. <laughs> Some of you guys say, well, pastor, you don't understand. My wife uses every dish in the house when she cooks. Well, guess what? Try it when she don't cook. Amen. Amen. The bottom line is this, we choose evil. We choose evil out of our free choice. If we live in a real world with real choices, either for good or for evil. Amen. We are where we are today, and everybody in this world is where they are today, where their choices has led them, has led them in life. You can't blame God for where you are in life. You can't even blame Satan for where you are in life. This nation cannot blame Satan for where we are today. This nation has made a conscious choice to reject Jesus Christ and to embrace the evilness of Satan. Amen. That is exactly what has happened. Where is God, Pastor? Where is God? He's still here. He's still just as powerful and awesome as he's ever been. However, what he's done is he said, you know what? You want evil. That is your free choice. So you know what I'm doing? I am just turning you over 
to the choices that you want to make in life. And we look at it and we blame it on God. I hear people saying that all the time. Why would a loving God allow this and allow that? Folks, listen. Don't you think it breaks God's heart to see some of the things that's happening in this world? But it's happening because of evilness in the world. People have chosen evil. Many Christians have a wrong perspective as to the nature of things in this age. Many think God has this world in his hands. And he does in some ways. But listen, Satan is the one that is really controlling this crazy world of ours. He's controlling it because we're letting him control it. And Satan is the one that's designing and manipulating a lot of the damage that we're seeing in this world today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Look what it says. Satan, who is the what? God of this world, has blinded the eyes of those who don't believe. That's exactly what he's done to this world. We have chosen evilness over God. We have pushed God away from everything. All truth, we don't want to hear anything about it. What we have done is we've made a conscious decision to embrace evilness. And because of that, Satan has brainwashed people into believing that there is no place for God's word in your life or in your family. No place for it. Because, after all, God is a killjoy God. He doesn't want you to have happiness. He doesn't want you to have any joy. He doesn't want you to have any success in life. You follow the principles of God in your life, and your life will be boring. Listen. He's blinded. He has brainwashed this crazy world of ours. And he's done a real good job of it. It says they were unable to see the glorious light of the good news. That's why when you and I witness to people and we tell them about Jesus, they look at us like a deer in headlights. They don't understand what you and I are saying to them. Amen. It's like me trying to talk to somebody that's from Germany. They are speaking to a North Carolina country boy. I'm listening to them say everything. And the only thing that I understand they say is bratwurst. (laughs) Or I think something else they eat in Germany is called schnitzer doodle. I may understand that. But when I look at them and I say, I like barbecue pork, baked beans and tater salad, they're going to look at me like a deer in headlights. Why? They ain't never had any barbecue pork. They don't know what tater salad is. And God knows they never had no sweet tea or grits. I'm speaking a foreign language to them. They don't understand. And the reason they don't understand is because they don't have never been cultured to what American folks like or, or know about. They've been blinded to our ways. I've been blinded to their ways. Don't hold me responsible for not understanding them and don't hold me responsible you know, for them not understanding me. Same way it is with people that don't know the Lord. Sometimes you're talking to them about the Lord and they don't understand. Listen, understand this. It's not sometimes that they don't want to understand. Satan has blinded their eyes. So what you need to do is to, uh, is to pray that God will allow those blinders to come up so they can understand. And he's promised that he will do that at least one time in their life. They'll understand it. So They're blinded to that. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. They don't understand it. That's why they're following the ungodly ways. They don't understand. Let me tell you, 
The lordship of the Lord on this earth is still not where it needs to be, but it's coming. We see evil in this world right now. We see this world going crazy. But I will tell you this. Have you ever heard that phrase in the Bible that says, thy kingdom come? His kingdom is coming. It's coming. The Lord is getting ready to rapture those of us that know the Lord. And the twinkling of an eye, he's going to come back and he's going to take us home. That's really, really close. You know, I read an article about uh, China just yesterday about how their military exercises were closer to Taiwan than they've ever been before. They are already telling people in their nation that if you are a professional, even if you're working in education, I want you to get ready because you're about ready maybe to be called up into our armed forces in one way or another. They are stretching their arms, flexing their muscles, and letting everybody know that all hell is about ready to be unleashed. Folks, somebody said to me yesterday, Pastor, the river Euphrates is drying up. Yes, it's drying up. Look it up. It's drying up. Never has it dried up to the point where it's drying up today. It's drying up. They don't understand it. Those of us that know the Lord know it. We understand it. The Bible says that Euphrates River is going to go dry. You know why it's going to grow, go dry? Because the armies of China have to cross across the river of Euphrates to be able to get to the battle of Armageddon. That's why the river of Euphrates is drying up. And people still say there's not a God. <laughs> Folks, you listen. There is a God. He's about ready to come back, and he's about ready to say, I'm coming back, and I'm about ready to set this world back to where it needs to be. There's going to be the rapture. There's going to be seven years of tribulation, three and a half years of peace, where people are going to believe in the Antichrist, but then there's going to be seven and a half years of pure hell on this earth when the Antichrist truly reveals his colors, and there's all kinds of plagues that are going to hit this world like we've never seen before. And then after those three and a half years, the Lord is going to come back and he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. Satan is going to be bound and we are going to be able to have heaven on this earth. Amen. If God, in your notes, if God sees evil and cannot stop it, and does not stop it. It means, in some people's eyes, that he wills it. This is nonsense. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, to believe in him as your Lord and as your Savior, if you choose to serve evil, the evilness of the world, then... You choose today whom you will serve. Some of us have a hard time accepting the fact that, again, God does not control this world. Part of the problem is this. We realize God knows everything and he's able to do as he pleases. This means that nothing happens that God does not allow. Some actually say, if God allows something to happen, that's equal to God willing it. Let me say this to you. God wills a lot more than he sees that is happening. It is God's will for everybody to be saved. But you know what? He's not going to circumvent free will and automatically make everybody receive him as Lord and Savior. His will is for us to know the Lord. But again, he's not going to make it happen if we don't want it to happen. Because therefore, it would circumvent our free will. God is not, God's will is for this world to be perfect. God's will is for us not to have any shootings. Not for us to have any child abuse. 
Not for us to have all the things in this world. But you know what? He's not going to make people robots. You know why people do the things they do? Because they have chosen their lifestyle. They've chosen it. They have chosen this day who they are going to serve. It breaks God's heart. God wants everybody to be saved, but some are going to be lost. And you know what? He weeps very, very hard when judgment comes to this world. He weeps. Revelation chapter 3, verse part of verse number 20. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. God's purpose is for us to voluntarily find him as our Lord and as our Savior. But this requires, folks, it requires free will. God allows everybody to either embrace him as Savior or to reject him as Savior. God has nothing to do with most of the things that happens in this world. He's not in it. He did not cause it. He did not approve it. But sometimes he allows it because he desires everybody to see that he is the only answer. You know, like you, I hate to see evilness in this world. I hate to see things that happen. It really does. It hurts my heart. But we will never, ever know. Listen to me. We will never, ever know sometimes how many people's lives have been changed and how many people have been won to the Lord through things that have happened in this world that we don't approve of. There is a a grave over at Memorial Park Gardner. It's a grave of a young lady. And that young lady was a pastor's daughter. She was shot and she was killed at church some years ago. The reason that she was shot and killed is because somebody in the church had just gotten a new gun. And they were showing that new gun off at church. The gun was loaded. They didn't know that it was. They pulled the trigger. The gun shot off, went through the wall, and struck that pastor's daughter and killed her instantly. I have gone through by this grave several times in my funerals that I've done at Memorial Park just to look at the beautiful memorial that this pastor and family have done for their daughter and for this young lady that is in their family. Several months ago, I went down the road again where that memorial is. And I looked ahead and I saw somebody there. And they were tidying up things. They were trimming some bushes and they looked like they were arranging some flowers. I had a few minutes and I said, I'm going to stop and I'm just going to see if I can be an encouragement to these people. So I pulled up very slowly and I rolled my window down and I put my truck in park. And the man that was there, he turned around and he looked at me. And I said, are you pastor so-and-so? So I knew his last name. And he said, yes, I am. I said, I'm pastor so-and-so. And I just want you to know that I heard about what happened to your daughter. And I can only imagine going through that with a member of one of my family. 
And you don't know me. I've never met you. But you know something? I admire you so much. Because everything that I've ever heard you say and was written in the newspaper or on television or any interview that I've ever heard you make, and I've heard several of them, I have never heard you once curse God and to say why a loving God would do this or that. You have stood by your faith. And you have said, I may not know why, but I am not. I am not going to walk away from the God that I have loved and I've preached about all of my life. I'm not going to allow this to take me away from pastoring. I'm not going to allow it. If anything, I'm going to help this to make me stronger. Well, I looked at him and I had tears in my eyes. And I said, Lord, bless this man. Lord, bless this family. You know, folks, we need to understand this. We need to understand that, we, that God loves us with an everlasting love. There's nobody in this world that the Lord loves more than you. He loves you with all your faults, through all of your imperfections. And he sees the broken hearts that you have. And I know that I'm, as I'm preaching this, this congregation is full and people are full online that you would say, Pastor, why did this happen? Pastor, why did that happen? I'm with you. But we've also got a lot of people here this morning that say, you know what? I know that my God loves me. And I know that God loved my loved one or he loved my friend or he loved these folks over here. And I know that God had a reason for what he did. I may not understand it. And the reason that I don't is because I'm not God. And I don't understand the beginning from the end. But I have perfect confidence that my God, through all of the tragedy, all the heartbreak, is still weaving things together in my life and other people's lives for his honor and for his glory. Also, I've seen things happen in my life and Vicki's life that we have not liked. One thing in particular that I won't share with you, but has happened in our life. It absolutely broke our hearts. It absolutely tore us into a million pieces. You say, Pastor, you shouldn't be like that. You know, you should be, you should be stronger. I'm not. I'm not. I'm human. And things hurt me. But I will tell you this, from the thing that happened to us, our tragedy in life, we've had many, but in this particular one, I didn't understand it at the time. And in fact, all honesty, I got mad at God. Pastor, I don't think you ought to do that. Well, tough. <laughs> I did. Because you know, as far as I knew, I was doing everything in my life for his glory. There wasn't any sin in my life. I was wading through hell by the inch. Are you kidding? Why would you bring this to our doorstep? Why? Why? I want you to answer me. He didn't. I still preached. Vicki still was there and encouraging me, and she was, honestly, she was a whole lot better in her spiritual walk than I was with mine, a lot more. But 
one day, I had an opportunity to do a funeral service. You know what? I told those people, I understand what you're going through. I have walked this walk. And up to that point, the other funerals that I had done, in those occasions, I couldn't say that because I didn't know that was one of the best funerals that God ever spoke from this pastor because I was able to relate. I got in my truck. I was driving away from the cemetery. And I stopped. And I said, Lord, I now I know. You know what? He's given Vicky opportunities to say, I know what you're going through. She's had a glorious ministry down through the years. And you know how many more times I've got an opportunity to tell people that I know what you're going through. But God had to take away for the glory of him to get more glory out of my life and Vicki's life. For us to touch people in a way that we couldn't touch people before. So what I'm saying to you is this. We hurt. We hurt for ourselves. We hurt for our people and our family. We hurt for others. But I will tell you this. God has a reason. He has a reason for what he does. We need to love God enough. We need to trust him enough to know that he never makes any mistakes. Amen. Well, let's bow our heads, please, and let's stand to our feet.